Good day, everyone. We are no strangers to the fact that respiratory system is a part of every second in our lives. But have you ever wondered how it works? Now, allow me to enlighten you guys regarding this topic. The organs of the respiratory system. It includes the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and their smaller branches and the lungs, which contain the alveoli or terminal air sacs. At this point, let us discuss them one by one. First, the upper respiratory tract. The nose, whether button or hook in shape, is the only externally visible part of the respiratory system. During breathing, air enters the nose by passing through the nostrils or nares. The interior of the nose consists of nasal cavity aligned with mucosa which warms, filters, and moistens incoming air. Nasal cavity divided by a midline nasal septum and separated from the oral cavity by the palate. The olfactory receptors for the sense of smell are located in the mucosa in the slit-like superior part of the nasal cavity, just beneath the ethmoid bone. Are you curious why we might have a runny nose on a crisp, wintry day? Well, to explain that, the ciliated cells of the nasal mucosa create a gentle current that moves the sheet of contaminated mucus posteriorly toward the throat or pharynx, where it is swallowed and digested by stomach juices. We are usually unaware of this important cilia reaction, but when the external temperature is extremely cold, these cilia become sluggish, allowing mucus to accumulate in the nasal cavity and to dribble outward through the nostrils. I hope that explains your curiosity regarding the runny nose theme. Wow, the topic regarding organs of the respiratory system is indeed illuminating that makes us learn more. With that being said, let us unfold the pharynx. Pharynx is a muscular passageway about 13 cm or 5 inches long that vaguely resembles a short length of red garden hose. Commonly called the throat, the pharynx serves as a common passageway for food and air. It is continuous with the nasal cavity anteriorly via the posterior nasal aperture. The pharynx has three regions, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. In addition, Clusters of lymphatic tissue called tonsils are also found in the pharynx. The tonsils play a role in protecting the body from infection. Our next topic is the larynx. The larynx or voice box routes air and food into proper channels and plays a role in speech. Located inferior to the pharynx, it is formed by eight rigid hyaline cartilages and a spoon-shaped flap of elastic cartilage, the epiglottis. Moving on, we're going to talk about the structures of the larynx. The largest of the hyaline cartilages is the shield-shaped thyroid cartilage, which protrudes anteriorly and is commonly called the Adam's apple. Next, sometimes referred to as the guardian of the airway, the epiglottis protects the superior opening of the larynx. Part of the mucous membrane of the larynx forms a pair of folds, called the vocal folds or true vocal cords, which vibrate with expelled air. This ability of the vocal folds to vibrate allows us to speak. The vocal folds and the slit-like passageway between them are called the glottis. Let us proceed to the lower respiratory system, the trachea. Trachea is fairly rigid because its walls are reinforced with C-shaped rings of hyaline cartilage. These rings serve a double purpose. The open parts of the rings about the esophagus and allow it to expand anteriorly when we swallow a large piece of food. The solid portions support the trachea walls and keep it patent or open, in spite of the pressure changes that occur during breathing. Now, we have the main bronchi to talk about. Did you know that the right and left main or primary bronchi are formed by the division of the trachea? Each main bronchus runs obliquely before it plunges into the medial depression or helum of the lung on its own side. The right main bronchus is wider, shorter, and straighter than the left. Consequently, it is more common sight for an inhaled foreign object to become large. By the time incoming air reaches the bronchi, it is warm, cleansed of moist impurities and humid. The smaller subdivisions of the main bronchi within the lungs are direct routes to the air sacs. Moving forward, let us explore the lungs. The lungs are essential organ of respiration. 
The main function of lungs is to give enough supply of oxygen to the different parts of the body and get rid of carbon dioxide and other waste from the blood. The lungs are paired organs flanking the mediastinum and the thoracic cavity. The surface of each lung is covered with its own visceral serosa, called the pulmonary pleura or visceral pleura, and the walls of the thoracic cavity are lined by the parietal pleura. Pleural fluid decreases friction during breathing. The lungs are primarily elastic tissue and passageways of the bronchial tree. The smallest passageways end in clusters of air sacs called alveoli. Let's proceed to the respiratory zone structures and the respiratory membrane. The terminal bronchioles lead into respiratory zone structures, even smaller conduits that eventually terminate in alveoli or air sacs. Respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts and sacs, and alveoli, which have thin walls through which all gas exchange occurs with pulmonary capillary blood, are respiratory zone structures. Gas exchange in respiratory membrane occurs by simple diffusion through the respiratory membrane. The final line of defense for the respiratory system is in the alveoli. Remarkably efficient alveolar macrophages, sometimes called dust cells, wander in and out of the alveoli picking up bacteria, carbon particles, and other debris. Also scattered amid the epithelial cells that form most of the alveolar walls are cobodial surfactant secreting cells, which look very different from the squamous epithelial cells. These cells produce a lipid or fat molecule called surfactant, which coats the gas-exposed alveolar surfaces and is very important in lung function. At this point, let us know more about respiratory physiology. The respiratory system is responsible for supplying the body with oxygen and disposing carbon dioxide. Now, let us dig deep to the four distinct events, collectively called respiration. These are the following. First, we have the pulmonary ventilation, which is the movement of air into and out of the lungs, or what is commonly known as breathing. Second, is the external respiration, wherein gas exchange between the pulmonary blood and alveoli must take place. Third, is the respiratory gas transport, in which oxygen and carbon dioxide must be transported to and from the lungs and tissue cells of the body via the bloodstream. Lastly, is the internal respiration which, at systemic capillaries, gas exchange occurs between the blood and cells inside the body. Moving forward, now we have the mechanics of breathing where gas travels from high pressure to low pressure areas. Pressure outside the body is atmospheric pressure and pressure inside the lungs is intrapleural pressure, which is always negative. So, there are two phases of breathing. First is the inspiration or inhalation, which happens when inspiratory muscles contract, intrapulmonary volume increases, its pressure decreases and air rushes in. The diaphragm presses the abdominal organs downward and forward. Then, the expiration or exhalation, which happens when inspiratory muscles relax. The lungs recoil and air rushes out. The diaphragm rises and recoils to the resting position. How great it is to fathom the mechanics of breathing. Let us now proceed to the respiratory volumes and capacities. There are four air volumes exchanged during breathing. These are EV, IRV, ERV, DC, and residual volume. First, we have the tidal volume or TV which is the amount of air that moves in or out of the lungs with each respiratory cycle. Next, we have the inspiratory reserve volume, or IRV, which is the amount of air that can be taken in and forcibly above the tidal volume. Then, we have the expiratory reserve volume, or ERV, which is the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled beyond tidal expiration. Next is the vital capacity, or VC, which is the total amount of exchangeable air. Lastly, we have the residual volume, which is a non-exchangeable respiratory volume, which allows gas exchange to go on continually. Parameter measures the respiratory capacities. 
Spirometer testing is useful for evaluating losses in respiratory functioning and in following the course of some respiratory diseases. Examples Pneumonia Inspiration is obstructed and the IRV and VC decrease. Emphysema Expiration is hampered, the ERV is much lower than normal and the residual volume is higher. Next, we'll go to several non-respiratory air movements. Non-respiratory air movements are voluntary or reflex activities that move air into or out of the lungs. They include cough, sneeze, crying, laughing, hiccups, and yawn. The next topic we're able to tackle is respiratory sounds. As air flows into and out of the respiratory tree, through this, two recognizable sounds can be picked up with a stethoscope. We have the two types of respiratory sounds. The first type is the bronchial sounds which are produced by air rushing through the large respiratory passageways. The second one is vesicular which are the breathing sounds that occur as air fills the alveoli. Let's now go to external respiration, gas transport, and internal respiration. I'm sure all of us are very curious about this. What really happened during external respiration? So, during external respiration, dark red blood flowing through the pulmonary circuit is transformed into the scarlet river that is returned to the heart for distribution to the systemic circuit. In external respiration, oxygen diffuses across the respiratory membrane from the alveolus to the capillary, whereas carbon dioxide diffuses out of the capillary into the alveolus. Next, we have the gas transport in the blood. During this process, oxygen is transported in the blood into two ways. A small amount of O2 is carried in the plasma as a dissolved gas, while most attach to hemoglobin molecules inside the red blood cells to form oxyhemoglobin. Meanwhile, when carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin, a molecule called carbaminohemoglobin is formed. Moving on, now we have the internal respiration. In this process, oxygen leaves and carbon dioxide enters the blood. In the blood, carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, which quickly releases bicarbonate ions. Then, the bicarbonate ions diffuse out into plasma, where they are transported. At the same time, oxygen is released from hemoglobin, and the oxygen diffuses quickly out of the blood to enter the cells. As a result of these exchanges, venous blood in the systemic circulation is much poorer in oxygen and richer in carbon dioxide than blood leaving the lungs. Next, we have the control of respiration. Neural regulation or the setting of basic rhythm. So what happens is that the activity of the respiratory muscles, the diaphragm and the external intercostals is being regulated by nerve impulses transmitted from the brain by the phrenic nerves and intercostal nerves. Neural centers that control respiratory rhythm and depth are located mainly in the medulla and pons. In the picture, we can see that the medulla contains two respiratory centers. The first, the ventral respiratory group, contains both inspiratory and expiratory neurons that alternately send impulses to control the rhythm of breathing. The inspiratory neurons stimulate the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles via the phrenic and intercostal nerves, respectively, during quiet breathing. Impulses from the respiratory neurons stop the stimulation of the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles, allowing passive exhalation to occur. The pons respiratory centers, which also communicate with the VRG, help to smooth the transitions between inhalation and exhalation during activities such as singing, sleeping, or exercising. Now, we are going to talk about the different non-neural factors that influences the respiratory rate and depth. So, first, we have the physical factors. In this factor, breathing, physical factors such as talking, coughing, and exercising can modify both the rate and depth of breathing. Increased body temperature also causes an increase in the rate of breathing. Next, we have the volition or conscious control. In this factor, Breathing may be consciously controlled if it does not interfere with homeostasis. 
Such an inhibition is obvious in specific respiratory acts such as breath holding. However, voluntary control of breathing is limited, and respiratory centers will simply ignore messages from the cortex when the oxygen supply in the blood is getting low or blood pH is falling. Next, we have the emotional factors. So, emotional factors such as fear, anger, and excitement also modify the rate and depth of breathing. All of these result from reflexes initiated by emotional stimuli acting through centers in the hypothalamus. Lastly, we have the chemical factor. Although many factors can modify respiratory rate and depth, the most important factors are chemicals, the levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood. Changes in carbon dioxide levels are the most important stimulus affecting respiratory rhythm and depth. A rising level of carbon dioxide or a drop in pH independent of CO2 in the medulla results in faster, deeper breathing. Falling levels lead to shallow, slow breathing. Let's now proceed to respiratory disorders. Respiratory disorders. The respiratory system is particularly vulnerable to infections because it is open to airborne pathogens. We have already considered some of these inflammatory conditions such as rhinitis and tonsillitis. Now, we will turn our attention to the most disabling respiratory disorders, the group of diseases collectively referred to as chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or COPD and lung cancer. These disorders are living proof of cigarette smoking's devastating effects on the body, long known to promote cardiovascular disease. Cigarettes are perhaps even more effective at destroying the lungs. The first respiratory disorder is the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, exemplified by chronic bronchitis and emphysema, are a major cause of death and disability in the United States. COPD means progressive inflammatory lung disease which is characterized by increasing breathing difficulty. The chronic bronchitis, which is characterized by excessive production and pulling of mucus in lower respiratory passageways which severely impairs ventilation and gas exchange. Patients may become cyanotic as a result of chronic hypoxia. The emphysema, which is characterized by permanent destruction and enlargement of alveoli. The lungs lose their elasticity and expiration becomes an active process. So, the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or COPD are basically a combination of these two conditions. And that wraps up our knowledge exploration about the respiratory system. And we hope you were able to provide and feed some facts and understanding into your minds. Thank you and keep learning!